Here are the stories that we're covering in the Category 5.TV newsroom. For the first time, BBC News published a news story for every constituency that declared election results overnight, all written by a computer. A Russian police raid on Nginx's Moscow office last Thursday has raised concerns among users of the popular web and proxy server software. Linux has destroyed every competing OS in the supercomputer market, taking a 100% share of the top 500. And remember when the owner of cryptocurrency exchange Quadriga CX passed away, taking hundreds of millions in customer crypto to the grave with him? Well, now investors are beginning to wonder if he actually died or if he just took the money and ran. Stick around. The full details are coming up later in the show. This is the Category 5.TV Newsroom, covering the week's top tech stories with a slight Linux bias. I'm Robbie Ferguson, filling in this week for Sasha Rickman. Some quick honorable mentions. Uh, well, HP is fighting a very real environmental problem by building their laptops out of ocean-bound plastics. In September, HP introduced their Elite Dragonfly Notebook, the world's lightest compact business convertible, and get this, the world's first notebook made with ocean-bound plastic. HP also announced its commitment to include ocean-bound plastic materials in all of its new HP Elite and Pro Desktop and Notebook computers launching in 2020. This move reflects HP's commitment to addressing the growing challenge of ocean plastics. To date, HP has sourced more than 1 million pounds of ocean-bound plastics. That's the equivalent of more than 35 million plastic bottles. They've been using it in their ink cartridges, HP Elite Display E273D monitors, and now the HP Elite Dragonfly. A new high-end Linux laptop has launched that is more powerful than a MacBook Pro. And it could even be uh, more powerful than System76's Oryx Pro. It's called the Kubuntu Focus and is a joint effort between the Kubuntu Council, Tuxedo Computers, and Mindshare Management. The target audience for the Kubuntu Focus is users who find the MacBook Pro too limiting in power and compatibility with Linux. But looking at the specs, it looks like a dreamy system for Linux power users, gamers, content creators, and developers as well. This isn't a laptop designed for, uh, from the ground up, however. The Kubuntu Focus takes roughly the same approach as System76 does by taking a stock Clevo unit and adapting it for Linux. This one is specifically tuned for battery life and an optimal NVIDIA KDE experience out of the box. Now, quick specs look like this. A Core i7-9750H, 4.5 gigahertz turbo processor, Keep in mind, this is a laptop. A GTX 2060 GPU with six gigabits of onboard RAM, uh, gigabytes of onboard RAM, 32 gigabytes of system RAM, one terabyte NVMe storage, and a 16.1 1080p full HD IPS display with a matte finish. All this will come in for less than the price of a MacBook Pro with the estimated sale price at about $2,400. Now let's get into the top stories that we're following this week in what the BBC says is their biggest test of machine-generated journalism so far. BBC News published a news story for every constituency that declared election results overnight, all written by a computer. Each of nearly 700 articles, most in English but 40 of them in Welsh, was checked by a human editor before publication. Now, the head of the project said that the tech was designed to enhance the service provided, not to replace human reporters. Robert McKenzie, editor of BBC News Labs, says, This is about doing journalism that we cannot do with human beings at the moment. Using machine assistance, they were able to generate a story for every single constituency that declared during last week's general election, Now, which they say would not have been even possible with human reporters. 
Several news organizations are testing automated journalism as a way of covering data-driven stories more efficiently. The technology can quickly produce stories focused on numbers, such as, say, football, football scores, um, company financial reports, and general election results, obviously. Now, Mr. McKenzie said that the articles reflected a BBC style because the choice of phrases could, in fact, be programmed in advance by BBC writers. He said, quote, as a journalist, you try to think of every conceivable permutation of a story in advance. Then you write a template. Now, the machine selects particular phrases or particular words in response to precise pieces of data. So you can write everything if you want to in house style, he says. He goes on to clarify this clearly only works on stories that are grounded in data. It is not a technology that allows you to do any kind of analysis. How interesting is that? So it makes sense. I love that things can be aggregated and then put into language that we can understand and, and read. And, and, and it's been happening for years, but now it's actually happening in, in news source as well. And it's not really, I mean, it, you could say that, hey, this is a, this is some people may have a, an, an issue with automation, AI, writing the news. But this is data. This is like stuff that in the middle of the night, cryptocurrency numbers are changing. And so a report could be generated in something other than just a list of numbers. No, it can be put into language that we can understand and appreciate and, and read. Uh, at our convenience. So I think it can be a really good thing. And I do appreciate that the BBC is saying that this is something that is meant to augment uh, their current reporting. So it's not something that's going to put people out of work. No, it's something that's going to give them um, additional content that they don't have to actually sit down and write. They can just proofread it and make sure it's good and then push the AOK -OK go. What do you think? Let us know your comments below. A Russian police raid on Nginx's Moscow office last Thursday has raised concerns among users of the popular web and proxy server software. Several employees, including chief developer Igor Siosiov, we'll just say Igor, and co-founder Maxim, I'm just going to leave it at that. They were interviewed by police over a criminal copyright infringement complaint. Now... Get this, the raid arrived a week after Russian search engine and internet firm Rambler, um, they, who was the former employer of one of those aforementioned, uh, they claimed full ownership of the Nginx code. In addition, Rambler Internet Holdings is requesting the equivalent of about 810,000 US dollars. Nginx, a firm created in 2011 to provide support for users of the open source web server software of the same name, was bought by US firm F5 Networks for $670 million back in March. Nginx was first released, as far as the software goes, in 2004. Around a third of the web's servers in the world use Nginx, often as a load balancer. Even if Rambler can prove their case against Nginx, F5 wants to calm fears about future support and product development by reminding its users that master software builds of its open source software are stored outside of Russia. How scary is that? So if what they're saying is true, so the claim is that this guy worked at Rambler and while he was working there, presumably on company time, was developing Nginx. And so now they're saying, hey, that's our software. He was on company time. That's a scary thing. And, and what does that mean for, for the, like, the world of open source? Because Nginx is huge. The th like in the top three, like Apache's in there. Um, I don't know who the number two is. Can't be IIS. That'd just be wrong. But we'll just say Nginx is in the top three. Um, interesting thing about Rambler is that it seems like they are going after a lot of 
individuals and companies right now? I don't know if their legal department has changed or if they've just said, hey, let's look at ways to bring income out of other things. Like they're suing Twitch right now. So Twitch, the online gaming community, the, the broadcast video, used to be Justin.tv. Rambler is suing them because uh, of users using the Twitch service to rebroadcast um, uh, football games and things like that illegally. Well, Twitch says it's not really our fault. Like, we offer the platform. We have the policies in place that say you're not allowed to do that. If someone does, though, it's not like we have uh, people policing it. Uh, if we knew about it, if you had have come to us, if Rambler had have come to us, we would have shut it down. So in retro, as retroactive as this is to try to sue us over this, like they're trying to, to, they're actually trying to have Twitch blocked in Russia. Like they're doing all kinds of stuff. And here, Nginx, the, one of the top three um, web server softwares in the world, and it's, it's open source software, is under attack severely rated and and who knows what's going to happen next so we're going to keep eyes on that and find out um, over the course of the next couple of weeks what is going to be happening with nginx now we've got to take a really quick break uh, the crypto corner and more of this week's top tech stories are going to be coming right up so don't go anywhere Welcome back to the CryptoCon. This week has been brutal. Market cap went down from 200 billion to now around 175 billion. Bitcoin dropped around 10%. Other coins dropped 15, 16%. It's been hard. Some of you will be celebrating. Uh, some of you will be sad. Those that are celebrating see the opportunity to buy more of their coins. And those that are sad are thinking of uh, leaving this community. Now, <clears throat> what advice can I give you here? because I've been through this here many times. And my advice is very simple, is when you form your opinion, just listen to a group of people. So don't listen to one single person, listen to a group of people and form your opinion that way. And why? Because this, this, this industry is not regulated. So there, it's an international uh, market and therefore there are many experts. Everybody can be an expert here. In the traditional industry, like stocks, for example, there are experts that only do, for example, forecasting 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Uh, it's a local thing. It's regulated, not the crypto industry. So be careful. Uh, take your decisions very uh, carefully. And as I recommend, listen to a multitude of uh, experts, not to only one person. So what else has happened this week? One thing, Mongolia, um, they are now implementing the possibility to purchase uh, or to pay with the taxi fare with the stablecoin, which is great. I mean, on an international basis, it's small, but it's great news for our industry. Then the European Central Bank, uh, Christine Lagarde, uh, started talking uh, in a press conference about uh, the future of, uh, of cryptocurrencies within the ECB. And they are building a task force which goes in line with what Italy is doing and Sweden is doing and Lithuania is uh, issuing uh, uh, crypto collectibles. So all good news around that area. Something that I found interesting is also Ripple now has over 450 employees. Uh, so it's a substantial size and I thought that was worth mentioning. And last but not least, uh, in the case of Quadriga, the lawyers are now pushing towards uh, physical evidence that the owner has passed away. Um, so that's going to be interesting. And in this channel, we're going to continue reporting about that. Um, what's the subject of the week? Subject of the week is going to be mining. There is one website which is called whattomine.com where you can calculate or uh, how much profit you're going to make if you select one or the other coin and you start mining that coin. I do recommend that you try to mine something, just select any coin, use your Raspberry Pi for this year. It's a great experience. 
you learn a lot about how to how this how a cryptocurrency or blockchain technology really works and uh, if you select it carefully you also will make some money don't focus on the real big ones like ethereum or bitcoin because from my point of view that you don't have any chance you don't learn a lot take those that are really small and that support for example a raspberry pi or a cpu um, and you will learn a lot so it's just because we're technology focused here it's something that i do recommend and that's from me so i wish you a great week and I'm looking, to for, I'm looking forward to see you soon. Thank you for watching. Thank you, Robert. Just a reminder to our community that we're not giving financial advice here. We're just sharing what's happening in the cryptocurrency market. It's clear that Linux is ruling the world of supercomputers as the latest from Top 500 reports that Linux is now the operating system of choice on all of the fastest 500 supercomputers in the world. Top 500 is an independent project that was launched in 1993 to benchmark supercomputers. It publishes the uh, details of the top 500 fastest supercomputers known to them twice per year. On their website, you can filter the list based on various criteria, such as country, operating system, vendor, and so on. Now, 20 years back, most of the supercomputers in the world ran the closed source Unix operating system. But eventually, Linux took the lead and became the preferred choice. Supercomputers are specific devices built for specific purposes. This requires a custom operating system optimized for those specific needs. So the fact that Linux is open source and easily modified to suit the individual supercomputer needs is likely why it's the only choice. Out of the top 10 fastest supercomputers in the world, USA has five, China has two, while Japan, Germany, and Switzerland have, Switzerland, pardon me, have one each. No surprise. I feel like, I feel like Windows used to be on that list. It totally makes sense, though, that open source is like, absolutely, I've never really given that much thought. But the fact that, say, Windows server operating system is a closed sourced OS, as is Mac OS, well, it makes sense that I would, as a developer, as a creator of a supercomputer, I'd want something that I can customize. And of course, they're going for the fastest. They want the best speeds. And how do we get to be the fastest? custom compiled software it has to be compiled on that architecture on that hardware that's what's so cool about linux i mean that's what's so appealing about say gen 2 or even arc linux in the world of linux for power users because you can compile the entire operating system on the specific hardware that you're going to be running it on so you're going to get the the absolutely optimal speed out of that system, presumably because it's going to be compiled specifically for the architecture and hardware that you have. That's cool. 100%. 100%. Yes. In late January, the wife of cryptocurrency exchange founder testified that her husband inadvertently took at least $137 million of customer assets to the grave when he died without giving anyone the password to his encrypted laptop. Now, just a moment ago, we heard from Robert on the Crypto Corner about this, and we're just going to go into more details. Now, see, what's happened is, is that outraged investors want to exhume the founder's body to make sure that he's actually dead. So this is, this is news all around. It's not just cryptocurrency news. This is like, this is a, a whole shift, in, a whole new way that I never, and it never even crossed my mind that this could be a scam. And now it's like, could it be a scam? Just to kind of rem remind us what happened. So back in February 2019, the wife of Jerry Cotton, the founder of Quadriga CX Cryptocurrency Exchange, submitted an affidavit stating that he died suddenly while vacationing in India at the age of just 30. The cause? Complications of Crohn's disease, a bowel condition that is in fact rarely fatal. At the time, Quadriga CX lost control of at least $137 million in its ca customer assets because it was stored on a laptop that, according to the widow's affidavit, 
only Cotton knew the password to. His widow, Jennifer Robertson, said that the laptop stored his cold wallet. Now, that's a digital wallet that's not connected to the internet. And it contained the digital currency belonging to customers of the exchange. According to Robertson, after attempts to guess his password, she went on to hire experts to attempt to decrypt the laptop, but they too failed. One expert even profiled Cotton in an attempt to hack the computer, but that attempt also came up with nothing. On Tuesday, the New York Times reported that the amount of the exchange clients were unable, the amount that they were unable to access is now, in fact, calculated to be $250 million. Meanwhile, law enforcement officials in both Canada, where Quadriga CX is located, and in the United States, are investigating potential wrongdoing, and investors are clamoring for proof that Cotton is actually dead. Lawyers representing exchange clients on Friday asked Canadian law enforcement officials to exhume his body and conduct an autopsy to confirm both its identity and the cause of death. According to a report from an auditing firm hired by the Supreme Court of Nova Scotia, Quadriga CX has transferred, quote, significant volumes of cryptocurrency, unquote, into personal accounts held by Cotton on other exchanges. That sounds kind of damning. The report also documented that the transfer, uh, it documented the transfer of substantial funds to Cotton personally that had no clear business justification. An autopsy is unlikely to lead to the recovery of the missing cryptocurrency, but it would go a long way to confirming or debunking the claims that Cotton died at the time and in the manner disclosed to Quadriga CX customers. As I said, like I can't even fathom that this could be fraudulent. And I don't want to believe that. I want, I, I mean, just like I'm sure the, the courts want to know that, yes, this was in fact what happened. I want to believe that it was an honest story. But I think what it, what it raises is that cryptocurrency has the, has opened this whole new method of somebody taking the money and running. And even if that's not the case here with Quadriga CX, it certainly is an eye opener to think that hey, this could in fact happen. Hollywood got to get a hold of this folks cuz this could make a heck of a great hacker movie, I got to say. Hmm. Hey, big thanks this week to Roy W. Nash, Johnny A. Solbu, and our community of viewers for submitting stories to us this week. Thank you for watching the Category 5.TV Newsroom. And don't forget to like and subscribe for all your tech news with a slight Linux bias. And if you appreciate what we do, become a patron at patreon.com slash newsroom. From the Category 5.TV newsroom and filling in for Sasha Rickman this week, I'm Robbie Ferguson.